God to bring forth the word. And I'm going to plead with the church not to fall asleep. Because the adversary always waits until the time for the word. We all get drowsy. And we ought to stay awake for the word. into our lives. Amen. Throughout the course of the week, and this is how I know this message is from God that it must be given to the church today. Throughout the course of the week, I was studying the book of First and Second Samuel, just reading through it throughout the course of the week. Going through it, going through it, and going through it. Little did I know that this week, Pastor Johnson would come to me and ask, give a word about Jonathan, I didn't even know this. I was preparing and I was just reading it for my own reading throughout the course of the week. Just like many other weeks when even the church bears witness when I said last week, Brother Lyndon, oh, actually when it was said about missionary service to, give, to speak about hell. Same thing. You study something, then you're called upon it unawares that that's what you have to speak on. So I'm sure that the Spirit of God wants this message to go forth. Amen. Amen. What I believe the Spirit has inspired me to title this message is, what does your CV say about you? Now, we all know, or we should all know what a CV is, a curriculum verte, correct me if I'm wrong, on the pronunciation, I know Brother Richard's probably cringing, but a curriculum verte, from my understanding. Now, this is what you present to a employer or a potential employer to say about what you are and where you've come from and so forth. Now, in the way that I'm saying this, ain't speaking of your curriculum verte, but I'm speaking about your Christian virtues. So what does your Christian virtues say about you? The story, and where I'll be sticking with for this message is 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel will be going through the story from there. And I'm going to start at chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. And to give us all a backdrop for who ain't familiar with the story, what I'll pick up from is where Samuel the prophet anoints or is sent out to anoint Saul. Amen. Now, what happens before this is that Israel was pleading to Samuel to have a king like the nations around them. And we all know where the, where the saying comes from, where God said, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. By not hearkening unto the word of the man of God, they didn't actually reject what the man of God was saying. They actually rejected God, unbeknownst to them. So I'll start from chapter 10, verse 1. And this is where God set in order to hearken unto the, the voice of the people. Though they wanted a king, God said, okay, I'll give you a king according to how I set it up to be. Yeah. Not how the people wanted it to be and how the other nations around them was. Here it says, chapter 10, verse 1, 
in 1 Samuel, then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said it is not because the Lord has appointed thee captain over his inheritance. Now, bearing in mind, brethren, here we see that Saul was appointed and anointed by God. And this is a very, very, very big lesson we can all learn from what we do with our anointing. Amen. What we do with our anointing is very important. As we would see as we go through this story here, I'm going to skip to chapter 15, verses 9. Chapter 15, verse 9, and here, after all, we see that Saul was doing the things of God and people that doubted that this man, because he was a humble man, even when he was told to be king by Samuel, he doubted it, saying, am I not a poor man from the family of the Benjamites and so forth? Oh he saw himself as humble, he didn't believe that he had what it took to be a king over Israel. Yes. Later on, we see that the people, through the wars that God used him to deliver the people from, they said that surely this man is anointed and appointed. Yes. Skipping over now to 15 verse 9, we see that there's a change that happens. And this is why I say be careful with your anointing. Yes. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And bear in mind at this point they were told to utterly destroy them. And the best and the best sheep of the oxen and the fatling and the lambs and all that was gold and was not utterly dis and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. So in other words, they was pick and choosing what to destroy. The things that was of good value, don't destroy that, but the things that was vile, obey God in that and get rid of that. Continuing verse 10, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying, it repent me that I have set up Saul to be a king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. All night. All night. So now, brethren, from this, it's important. Once we're anointed and appointed by God in whatever it may be, because everyone in the body of Christ is given something to edify the body. Everyone has their part. No, we're not all going to be kings and leaders or pastor of the church, mm. but the principle still stands, be careful with what God has given you, yeah. mm -hmm. and be obedient unto what he tells you to do yeah. with it. Mm. going to skip over to verse 28, and brethren, as I said, the word of God's going to do most of the talking today. Yes, we're going to go to 15 verse 28, it says, And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel unto thee this day, and has given it to thy neighbor of thine. That is better than thou. So now we see that Saul didn't do what was right with the anointing that God gave him. So what has God now done? He has now taken back from what he was blessed Saul with, and has now given it to his neighbor, and is going to give it to his neighbor. But then, here we're going to see how God sets things in order from this point onwards. God didn't just take Saul from the kingdom, throw him aside, and place his neighbor, who would see who this is later on. Turning over to 16 verse 1. And it says, 16 verse 1, and we'll see who it was God chose. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long would thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil. So now we're saying... Get ready to place the spirit upon someone else, fill your horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Amen. Now, we all know who this king is, or we should all know, King David. Here we see that now he's saying, go to the sons of Jesse, and then we all know the story where they all went before Samuel, and he thought that it was one of... David's brothers and said, surely this is the man. Yeah. God said, God don't look on the outward appearance, but looks yeah. on the heart. Yeah. And then he even chose, just like with Saul, which I think is interesting, a sheep, someone that was looking after sheep. Yeah. Saul was looking after sheep when Samuel 
found him. He was looking for his father's lost sheep. Now, Samuel's now going to David, who is looks after sheep, while he actually appeared to him. Here now we see David slews Goliath and so forth. You all know the story. And it was even promised to the man that slays Goliath, you'll be given all this and that and that. I'm skipping over that bit. That's not what I'm going to focus on for now. Skipping over that bit, and now David is now placed in influence of the armies of Saul, King Saul at this time. So yet again, as I'm saying, the promotion is starting, so we can even go back to CV. The promotion's now starting. God is now preparing him to fulfill the shoes that he's prepared for him. I'm going to turn to 18 verses 1. So that's First Samuel 18 verse 1. And it came to pass, when he had made, when he had made the end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So here we see that David's son Jonathan has a deep love for David. A deep. Sorry? Saul's son. Sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, Saul's son, Jonathan, had a deep love for David. So I don't maybe twist my own words there. So here we see that something interesting is happening. We'll see later on how God sets things in order. Amen. Once one is anointed and appointed, remember David was anointed a long time ago. So now we see that things are stepping in place that David may have not even knew at the time, which is preparing him. Reading on, it says, um, chapter, oh, sorry, verse 2, And Saul took him that day, and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Mm. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. Mm. That's how deep it was, brethren. Mm. Can you imagine loving someone as your own soul? That's a deep manner of love. And David went out with a soul. Saul went, sent him and behaved himself wisely. Amen. Now take note of that. Amen. David behaved himself wisely wherever Saul sent him. Mm. And that should go to us today. Whether it be in your job, whether it be in whatever God is setting you up to excel in, mm. you have to behave yourself wisely. Amen. Behaving yourself wisely, that could come in many different fashions, but always bear in mind to have wisdom in whatever we do. Whether that be job, whether that be in the church, whether that be anywhere, have wisdom. Reading on. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of all of Saul's servants. Yet again, now we see David is going up. But, it don't stop there. Something interesting now takes place. And when it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the woman came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul, with tambourettes, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the woman answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has his ten thousands. Uh-oh. Now we see there's a shift. Bearing in mind, what Saul should have done is even be joyous. Because by the hand of King David, he's slain and doing the work of God for the people. By this, and that should stand for every one of us today likewise. When one is exalted in the church or lifted up, we should all rejoice with them. Once we have envy within the church and saying, well, hold on, how comes he's, they're saying 10,000 for him and I only have thousands. And then there's envy and strife starts coming in, as what we'll see in this very story. That when one is lifted up and when they fight for a good cause, even if it's above what you're credited for, we should always have love and joy and rejoice with one another when Amen. one is lifted up. Amen. And that even goes for your, our jobs. Mm -hmm. That there shouldn't be any jealousy when one's lifted up or given a better promotion, anything. Yeah. So here we see, and Saul was very rough. Verse 8, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. 
brought thousands, you know. Now thousands he slain, and that is a great number by anyone's standards. But he's saying, but thousands. He's not pleased with the portion that God has given him to slay. But now he's looking upon the ten thousands David has slain and saying, whoa. You see, he's rough. He's rough for that. Reading on, and we'll see what happens. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forth and forward. Jealousy. But now we see that there's a secret beef, in other words. It's not open, but there's secret enmity. Amen. We have to be very cautious in everything and act wisely. David didn't know this, but bearing in mind that God was setting him up for a reason. God was also, I believe, putting in Saul, as we'd see, as you see that a spirit came from God, and we'll read on to that in a minute, upon Saul to place Saul in a mind state, but also give David a way of escape. So that in time, the shift would come and it would be a smooth transition. Going to go to verses 10 to 13. Here we see, and it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from yeah. God came upon Saul. Yeah. Now, bearing in mind what I just said, mm. God can even place it upon someone, and mm. God forbid it happens to any of us today, I'll mm. say that free. That God can place, if you have wrong a wrong spirit within you, mm. God can place something upon you mm. that mm. is going to be a, your own stumbling block. It will be your own stumbling block that you can't blame no one else but yourself because you had it in your heart and God's just helping you along the way. Verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times. King David used to, well, David at this time actually, used to play an instrument when this evil spirit will come upon Saul and it will be healed. So now we see, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. Imagine that, as David's playing, as other times to heal him, he threw a javelin to try and impale him on the wall. That's how deep God can send a delusion upon one so that things sit in order that you take yourself out of the way. And here we see, and it was only once, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided it out of his presence twice. Mm. Twice this happened. So twice, this envy was filled within King Saul to slay David. And we see later on, they say the only attempt. I'm gonna read from 14 now. And it says, and David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. So imagine that. David didn't even retaliate or even act, him, act off his emotions. He behaved himself wisely. But that's even a big, big example for us as well. You say, what does your CV say about you? Now, if anything, this shows that David is long-suffering and has true God-given love. Amen. That's something to take from this. And also, he had respect to authority, which we'll see later on. Behaved himself wisely. He was... Let's say, verse 15. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was very afraid of him. Yes. Now, that's something. When we behave ourselves wisely, brethren, when people are throwing darts at you, and I am quite literal in this term, when people are throwing darts at you, if you behave yourself wisely, Instead of rendering evil for evil, yeah. your actual enemies become afraid of you. Yeah. Because for one thing, you ain't giving them what they expect. Yeah. Mm. They see that your thinking is above their thinking. Yeah. If King David was here to start acting rebellious and do whatever so he fought in his emotions, then King Saul would have maybe expected it and he wouldn't have been afraid of him because he behaved himself wisely. Moving on, going to turn to 15, I'm um, sorry, verse 17 we see, and when, bear in mind, now Saul is obviously seeing there's not much I can do. So he has now a change in tactics. And Saul said to David, behold, my 
elder daughter, Mira, her will I give thee to wife. Only thou, only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. Now that's nothing wrong with that, right? For Saul said, let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. <laughs> so now he's shifted his tactics. He's saying, you know what, I can't even do this. Now what I'm going to do is dress up a present, in other words. Have you ever heard of a Trojan horse? In Greek mythology, I believe it is. I don't want to go into that, but you dress something up nicely. And the story goes that soldiers hid within a nice present. I believe it was a small statue. Troy. Sorry? Troy, the film. Oh, this is, it's actually based Real. off what people actually believe. Real. But I believe, I believe it is in the film, Troy. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So you, they set up something that looks presentable and nice so that the people will go to it. When you go to it, then bursts out soldiers and they slay the people. Amen. Same tactics here has been used by Saul, offering his daughter that when he goes to marry her and so forth, would set up that the Philistines would kill him. It would no longer have to be by the hand of Saul. But we see David was actually smart. And here we see, and David said unto Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the son-in-law to the king and so forth? So there we see that King Saul said they ain't gonna offer or ain't gonna accept a dowry. All he wants is a number of, I think it was around about 200 foreskins of the Philistines. So he'd have to slay them and thinking that that by its own would get rid of him. He would die in battle. But there we see that King David actually came, well, David at this time, don't trip myself up again. David came back and actually delivered on what Saul wanted to set him up and trip him up. So now we see that Saul gives him to his other daughter because he actually fulfilled his promise in verse 28. And we'll read there. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David. He can't set him up, God's with him. And Saul became afraid, sorry, oh, um, and was with David. And Micah, thanks, Saul's daughter loved him. This is his other daughter now. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Now we see this, we have to be careful, brethren. Sometimes people, and this is a man of God, and an and a anointed man of God, bear in mind. Be careful what we do with our anointing. comes back to that point. An anointed man of God is now trying to set up King David by many means. And he's secretly, continually his enemy. Smiling, giving him his daughter, which is a grand, great thing. Not knowing that he's actually trying to set him up. Now we see, we're going to skip to 19 verse 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan, his son. King Saul, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Remember, he loved him as his own flesh. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until morning, and abide in the secret place, and hide thyself. Mm -hmm. Now, this is serious business. One may even say that Saul's son informed, you know, as we'd say, he's an informer. But yet again, God had a plan, and no matter what, God's appointed new king is going to take place of this old, rotten king that's now misusing his anointing. So then, now we see, skipping a little bit, we'll see that Micah actually let David down by a window and so forth going to skip to um, verses 6. Here we see um, Jonathan actually speaks to David to his father and says, and he's telling him why should you kill him all the great things that David's done for Israel and so forth. Picking up from verse 6, and Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan and Saul swear, as the Lord liveth he shall not be slain. Now keep to your promises, this is another thing. Keep to your promises, brethren. If we say something, and me personally, I believe that you shouldn't even swear by the name of the Lord. Because it's not in man's power to keep your promises. 
Don't even make a swear unto the Lord. Don't even make a promise that if God does this, you'll do that. But this is what he done. Chapter, oh, sorry, verse 7, and Saul, and, and, sorry, and Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was with in his presence as in time past. So things are now back to normal. David's now, and if anything, David actually must have a forgiving heart. Imagine he tried killing him numerous times and so forth, but now he's back in his presence as in time past. Things are back to normal. There's no more beef. But does it stay so? Verse 10. Or oh, actually, I'll go to verse, um, yeah, I'll read from actually verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter. And they fled from him. So we've done a great thing yet again. He should be happy from this. But then, and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in the house with a javelin in the hand, and David played with his hand. So exactly the same thing. Exactly the same scenario. Remember, twice before David escaped. So if anything, this is the third time. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with a javelin. But he slipped away of the Lord's, of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Imagine that. Yet again, this also shows one more thing. Who God blesses, no man can curse. Amen. David continually, if it wasn't for God, may have been killed. Many a times, even in our personal lives, there's many things that we didn't get over. We cannot turn around now and say, you know what? If it wasn't for God that got me over that, I wouldn't be where I am now. In King David's case, it wasn't if God didn't save me from the hand of King Saul, he wouldn't have been king. So here we see God sets things up in order. Now David goes into hiding. In chapter 21, it says, it's the story when, when David, was in, David was into hiding, he went into the temple when he was hungry and ate the showbread. We should be familiar with that story because Christ even references it in the New Testament Amen. when it's speaking about the Sabbath day. So here we see, picking up the story from chapter 22, verses 14. Now I'm skipping and changing, brethren, but keep with me because there's gold nuggets that can be brought out from this story. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said who is faithful among all thy, the servants of David now bear in mind Ahimelech is the priest so what Saul is now doing is come to the priest that gave David the bread and is now saying what have you done what you basically you're for David you're secretly working for him now Ahimelech is answering I don't even knew I didn't even know there was enmity between you two as we'll see here so, bearing in mind, we'll see how Saul responds to this. Verse 14, and it says, And said, Who is so faithful among all thy servants, David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honourable in thy house? Did I then begin to inquire of the Lord for him? Be it far from me, let not the king impute any thing unto his servant, nor all the house of his father, for thy servant knew nothing, all this, less or more. So the priest is saying he knew nothing about this beef or nothing. So basically don't kill him and his family. King Saul wasn't a merciful man like King David. We see in verse 17 to 19. And the king said unto the footmen that stood by, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord. Behold, their hand also is with David. And they began to, and they knew, and they knew when he fled, and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. So imagine that even the servants had respect for the priests of the Lord. They knew that they were not to be touched. And then the king said to the dear, Turn thou and fall upon the priests, and Deog the, Emon, the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests and slew that day fourscore and five persons. 
and they were the Lunung of Ephraim. But now he's actually slaying all the priests in the city of North. Do we see it? The spirit that God can place upon someone can turn so wicked that you wouldn't even know your own stumbling block. You wouldn't even know that it's your own heart that now God is using against yourself. 